I want to change the angle, but it's totally okay with it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-ameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa ba'd. Inshallah ta'ala we'll continue with our series. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to ask the audience where we stopped. So who remembers what was the last discussion we had last week? Excellent. The story of Heraclius. Yes. And uh, who can summarize for us the story? What's the, in one sentence, if we were to ask you, or someone were to ask you, um, what is the uh, lesson from the story of Heraclius? Anything that comes to your mind, anything you feel. He received the knowledge, but he didn't get the guidance. Okay, he received the knowledge, he didn't get the guidance. Okay. Yeah, he was himself a scholar of uh, like Christianity. So he, and in his, in his knowledge, he knew that a prophet from this area, uh, this, uh, the area will come. Right. So he was trying to verify if uh, our prophet Muhammad <coughs> was the true uh, prophet or not. So whatever he asked, he confirmed that everything that he was asking is true uh, as far as the indication or whatever the... Right, so he didn't just go with hearsay, but rather he verified, he authenticated. He took the steps in order to see if this man who's claiming to be a prophet is indeed a prophet, okay? What else? Yes. Even though he knows the truth, he, uh, he's not guided. Very good. Yes, that's uh, as um, the Rush mentioned. All right, some of the things also to take home um, from this entire episode with Heraclius is that non-Muslims, a non-Muslim, such as, who was Heraclius asking or speaking with? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan who at the time was Muslim or non-Muslim? non-Muslim. So he is proving to the non-Muslims that amongst you is an individual who you should accept his truthfulness. I am all the way here, so far away from Makkah, so far away from the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yet I am confirming to you his truthfulness. Does it make sense? This point is that sometimes Someone feels that, you know, I'm more entitled to knowledge or more entitled to whatever it is in this dunya. And someone who does not have access to those things, that they value, subhanAllah. They value how important those things are. Case in point, those of us who are born Muslims and those who convert to Islam the dedication, the sacrifices, the difficulties that all of them went through, right? Something that we as born Muslims do not truly appreciate. So this is the point that here is Heraclius so many miles away from Mecca, an emperor, someone who's never met the Rasul proving to Heraclius, or rather proving to Abu Sufyan that this is an individual in your midst. What's wrong with you? what's going on with you, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes sometimes people to reflect. And I would like us to also take, think about our own lives. Sometimes certain events take place within our lives, right? Things happen, issues come up, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes us to ponder and to think and to reflect that I am the one who gives you and who takes things away from you. So never lose track of that. Keep your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sorry, there's some uh, sound testing that's going on. So just bear with that, inshallah, I don't get to results soon. <laughs> All right, so we talked about the ayah, which we will continue with, inshallah. What ayah was it that we introduced last time? Ibrahim, ayat 24 and 25, yes? So, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a symbolism of iman, how iman is. 
and Allah likens Iman to a beautiful tree. All right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Iman beautiful, and then He talks about how this tree itself is firmly rooted. So for a believer, our Iman must be firmly rooted. And that is why, please, brothers and sisters, remember that whenever you feel that there is something that is causing your Iman to waver, take that doubt out immediately. You don't want to keep it inside of you. Just like this tree Allah is describing, you want your Iman to be firmly rooted in your heart, in your qalb. It never shakes. Because doubts are like cancers. You allow a tree, the roots of a tree, to develop some type of cancer. It's not going to take long until the tree comes crashing to the ground. And this is what happens with people who experience crises of faith. That they have these doubts and they allow those doubts to simmer inside of them. No, we get it out of our systems immediately. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says that this is a tree whose branches are what? Are they bent and facing the ground or where are they facing? The heavens, the skies. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the mu'min, one of the benefits that the scholars mention is that the iman of a true believer can never be kept hidden. It will manifest itself, it will show, it will come out. Your iman causes you to act upon that iman. So if you hear people saying, my iman is in my heart. Nobody knows about it, my iman is in my heart. I don't pray, I don't fast, I don't... So then there's a big problem with this. So the first statement of this individual is, okay, that's fine. My iman is in my heart. Nobody knows about it. Yes, you're absolutely right. Nobody knows about it. Nobody can test it. You yourself cannot test your iman. All right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. But what you do know is when you do actions that harm that iman. You know full well when you do actions that strengthen that iman. So Iman is something, just like this tree, you can't hide it inside something. You can't put a cover over it and hide it. You can't. What happens during the winter? Now the winter is here. A couple weeks before this, you know, minus temperatures hit. What do you see in the uh, parks and then in these islands in the, uh, on, the, on the road? Trees that are nicely wrapped up, right? You can't hide the tree. Even with that wrapping up, nobody passing by says, oh, I wonder what this is. Maybe it's a cat. Maybe it's a car. Nobody says that. You cannot hide a tree. This is how tall and amazing this tree is. So the iman of a mu'min, of a believer, cannot be hidden, cannot remain hidden. That's the point. The iman of a believer necessarily shows itself. And who's a shining proof of this after the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. You all know the famous incident when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after Salat al-Fajr, he asked, who amongst you has given sadaqah today? Whose hand went up? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Next question, who amongst you has or is fasting today? Abu Bakr hands goes up. Who has followed a janazah? And Umar said, but we just started our day. Each time the Rasul is asking this question, Umar says, but we just started our day. And Abu Bakr keeps saying, I did, I did, I did. Who has followed a janazah? Who has given sadaqah? Who has fasted today? Four things. SubhanAllah. So Abu Bakr was an individual who just did these things naturally. It was his iman. It was his Iman. So Iman is something of a believer that soars to the skies. The next point of benefit from this analogy is that the branches of the tree, where are they headed towards? Towards the skies. Towards the sky. So your and my Iman take us closer and closer and closer to where? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is up above. Our Iman takes us close and close and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us in a number of a hadith 
that when a person becomes beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah becomes it's hadith Qudsi, where Allah Himself says, Then I become the sight with which He sees, the uh, hand with which He strikes, the legs or the feet with which He walks. And whenever the slave of mine asks of me, I grant him. Well, I grant her. Okay? So we're not going to give it some weird uh, explanation or some weird understanding to this hadith. Oh, Allah becomes the hand. Oh, Allah becomes the sight. The point is that this person starts seeing with the guidance of Allah. This person's whatever he touches, whatever he does with his hands, it's under the guidance of Allah. Whatever he listens or she listens to is by the guidance of Allah. This person is not going to listen to riba. He's not going to indulge in gossiping. This person is not going to look at haram. This person is not going to listen to haram. That's the point from this uh, hadith. Another point of benefit is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Tu'ti ukulaha that this tree gives fruits Every single time or every single season, every single season, this tree gives its fruits. And what are some of these fruits? Let's discuss. What are some of the fruits of Iman? Number one fruit, Jannah. Number one fruit is Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Kahf, the 18th Surah of the Quran, towards the end, ayah number 107, Allah says, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Inna al-ladina amanu wa amilu al-salihati kanat lahum jannatun fil dawsi nuzula." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that no doubt about it, that indeed it is those who have iman and do righteous deeds that for them is Jannatul Firdaus as an entertainment. For them is not just Jannah, but Al Firdaus. The second protection then is if Jannah is the first fruit, or is one of the fruits of this tree, a second fruit will then be the opposite of Jannah, protection from Jahannam, protection from the fire of hell. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in an authentic hadith, there shall be taken out from the fire of hell groups of people who had iman, the weight of a coin. After them shall be taken out groups of people who had iman, the weight of a leaf. After them shall be taken out people who had iman, the weight of a mustard seed. Then the only people who shall be left in Jahannam are those who have no Iman. Now, Iman, let us delve into Iman itself. Iman is of levels. Iman is of levels. A person may enter Iman by saying the Shahada. Okay? This is a person who enters Iman. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in an authentic hadith that every, this hadith is in Bukhari, every child is born pure and upon the fitrah. So every child is born upon something called the fitrah. Now this fitrah, is it equal to Islam? Or what is this fitrah? There are a number of explanations that the scholars have given, but it's beyond the scope of our audience to discuss into a lot of detail what that is. But know these levels of Iman. Okay, we talked about it in the first session, Hadith Jibreel, okay? So there is the level of Islam, then there is the level of Iman, and then there's the level of Ihsan, okay? Now, if you were to visualize, maybe next time we'll have the whiteboard here, inshallah, we'll do some little bit of uh, drawing, illustrating on the whiteboard. So if you have Islam, right beneath Islam is Kufr. Right beneath Islam is what people? Kufr. And Kufr means disbelief. Kufr means a person is no longer within the fold of Islam. Then you have Islam. This is the bare minimum of Iman. Remember, Ihsan, Iman, Islam, they're all levels of Iman. Okay? And that's why I told you, get a book. 
you have something to write with, inshallah ta'ala, it will become easy for you, okay? So, the bare minimum is Islam, a person can be a fasiq. What is fisq? Fisq is sin, all right? Fisq means sinning or to rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what fisq means. Now, when a person is a Muslim, is it possible for this Muslim to be an alcoholic? Is it possible? Yes, yes. Yes, it is. Is it possible for a Muslim to steal? Yes, yes it's possible. So this is the minimum level of Islam where a person has said the shahada, but he or she is engaging in heinous sins in sins that are unacceptable. Yes, but they are sins. Is it enough to make this person to kick them out of Islam? The answer is no. When a person drinks alcohol, this person is committing a grave crime against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this person has not left the pale of Islam. When a person steals, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yes, in an authentic hadith said that the person who steals while he is stealing does not have iman. What does that mean? Has he suddenly become a kafir? Well, there are some interpretations that say this, but for the purposes of our class, we say no. What the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying and referring to is this. Please listen carefully. That this person, while he is committing his sin, he is not a good Muslim. That this person, while he is stealing, he is not a good Muslim. He is a, he is a Muslim at a level that is not good. And that is why those who steal in the Quran, does Allah call them kuffar? Does Allah say that they are from the kafirun? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what their punishment is. Allah does not declare them kuffar. Is that clear, people? So, the level of Islam, which is the lowest level, that is the bare minimum level of Islam. The reason it's very important to understand this is that in our times there are people who declare others non-Muslims. Who declare other Muslims, let me rephrase, who declare other Muslims non-Muslims. So what is the dividing line then? This is what this course will inshallah ta'ala clarify to you. In an effort to understand these important distinctions in our religion. Alright? And in the hopes that inshallah we never ever fall to that level. We protect ourselves and our loved ones from that level. So you have the level of Islam which is the bare minimum level of Islam. If a person, an individual does not have this level, then for them is Jahannam. Is that clear? Eternal. When I say for them is Jahannam, it means eternity in Jahannam. Never are they coming out if they are non-Muslims. Is that clear? Under Islam. This is what we believe in. Now a very important point because this lecture will go online. It's very easy for people to pick and choose certain things that speakers and us Muslims say that, oh, you know what? This religion says every non-believer is damned to the fire of hell. We say we do not individually pick people and say, hey, you are going to Jahannam. You non-Muslim, you're going to Jahannam. You non-Muslim, you're going to Jahannam. We don't say that. No, we don't. Because look at the story of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is here standing in front of Heraclius and he is a non-Muslim. Abu Sufyan, close to two decades, the, the entire Risala of the Rasul was for how, how long? 23 years. Close to two decades, this person is fighting, hating on, trying to kill, trying to wipe out Islam and destroy the Muslims and kill the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is what he is doing, yet he accepts Islam. So what we say as Muslims is that we don't sugarcoat or mince our words. We say that the path to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is, is through Islam, no other paths. 
And you will see this, especially in our times, people like to say, you know, all sorts of things. We say, no, the path to Jannah is only one, and that is completely submitting your will, your desires to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what our deen teaches us, okay? So the path to Allah, to Jannah, is only one, and that is Islam. But we do not call for violence against non-Muslims. Forget violence. We don't even say to non-Muslims that you are going to Jahannam. What we are allowed to say is this path that you've taken, this lifestyle that you're leading, this is a lifestyle that does not take to Jahannam. And we don't mince our words. We don't mince our words in this. So you have the lowest level, Islam. Then you have Iman. Iman is what is the bare minimum that is required for someone to enter Jannah and to be protected from Jahannam. So if a person is a Muslim, is it possible for this person to go to Jahannam? Is it possible? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, it is. This is because they are in the third level, the lowest level of Iman. And that level is Islam. They're still committing sins. They're still doing things that are unacceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for which Allah will punish them. There's a threat of punishment. Is that clear? But what is the bare required minimum which inshallah all of us are striving towards? And that is take care of your five pillars. You take care of your five pillars. You've already said the shahada, the salah, you are taking care of your five daily prayers. You, when the month of Ramadan comes, you fast the month of Ramadan. When it's time to give zakah, you look at your assets, your wealth that you own, that after all expenditures, everything taken out, all, you know, the stuff that you've done, everything, all expenditures taken out, you still have a certain value that's above the Nisab value, you pay the zakah. Out of every hundred dollars, a tuni and 50 cents. 2.5 percent, subhanAllah. That is it. And then hajj, if you're able to, materially, you have wealth and health. You're able to go physically. Sometimes people have the wealth, but the physical health is not there, subhanAllah. So you take care of your five and you are sincere towards it. You have reached level two. You have reached level two. You will now, insha'Allah ta'ala, you are now guaranteed Jannah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are guaranteed protection from Jahannam. <clears throat> but again, who amongst us has a written agreement from Allah signed that you and I are going to Jannah? None of us. So we keep on aiming for the best. And who better to illustrate this to us? Again, back to Abu Bakr and Umar. And the Sahaba, the Sahaba, you go back to them, each one of them, as righteous and pious as they were, they were always afraid of Jahannam. Always worried that what if I go to Jahannam? SubhanAllah. So then what about us? So that's the level two is the bare minimum or the required, rather, required level of Iman. Don't fall below this, O Muslims. Protect yourselves and your loved ones from the fire. Allah tells us this in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu hu anfusakum wa ahlihi nara. That protect yourselves and your families from the fire of hell. So make sure you do that. Then of course, we come to the level of ihsan. Ihsan, as all of you know, is to worship Allah as though you see Allah Knowing full well that you cannot see Allah, but He surely, indeed, sees you. That is Ihsan. And when you and I reach Ihsan, guess what? It is the bare minimum level of Ihsan. Hopefully, that any righteous, pious, muttaqi, or a muhsina, or a muhsin, has begun to scratch the surface up. Because Ihsan has many, many, many levels. In fact, it's no exaggeration to say Ihsan is of infinite levels. Because where do you stop with Ihsan? Where do you stop? The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the peak of Ihsan. Will any one of us even come close to, you know, even the dirt on the feet of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. 
So Ihsan will now have so many levels where Alhamdulillah, a person will never drink alcohol. A person will never commit illicit relationships. A person will never steal. Alhamdulillah, you are off from that. You're now in the second level. But now, even within the second level, you're taking care of your five pillars. But guess what? You're praying five times. Uh, uh, you're, you're praying the Sunnah and the Nafil prayers. You're fasting Mondays and Thursdays, not just from a month. The ayyam al the three white days come upon you. You're fasting those. You're not just paying zakah 2.5%, but you're even giving sadaqah, not year-round, but every single day. SubhanAllah. Whether it's a couple coins here and there, whether it's hundreds of dollars, whatever Allah has given you, you are already doing that. That is iman. Then you start reaching perfection, ihsan. All of these, this is where level two and level three, the lines begin to blur. Because, alhamdulillah, you're not in the bare minimum, you're doing as much as you can. And this is where now, the different levels start coming in of those who are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you see such people, you just feel a sense of, a sense of their presence, Allah Akbar. That when a righteous and pious person, when you are in their presence, you feel that yes, I am in the presence of someone. Imam Ahmed ibn Hamdul rahimahullah, his students and those around him would say that just by merely looking at the face of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, we would be reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we would just feel, you know, that, that serenity, that peace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah make you and I from such people. Where subhanAllah, the nur is just exuding from us, the nur of what? Iman. That from us, the way this person speaks, that this person can never lie. The way this person carries himself or herself, you just see that Allah Akbar, perhaps there are angels around this person, right? So this is something that Allah blesses his chosen slaves, all right? And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who are from his chosen slaves. So we're still talking about all of this discussion was the second fruit. Remember, we were talking about protection, protection from Jahannam. The third fruit from the tree of Iman, dear brothers and sisters, is a key to have all of our deeds accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person does not have Iman, but he or she is fasting, we see this in our schools or maybe in universities, when a couple of you will get to university, those who are there, there's something called fast upon. In my university, we had that where we would invite you know, non-Muslims, sometimes even you would have uh, uh, non-Muslim uh, professors who would say, you know, we're gonna fast. And we're gonna uh, save that entire day's money that we would have spent on breakfast, on lunch, on whatever, and then we'll just donate it to your charity or something, right? So this is a great action, this is a good deed. But our faith tells us that before any action is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to have Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And again, not just Allah, but the things that Allah has said, the prophets and messengers that Allah has sent, which naturally includes the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Iman is the key to have all of our good deeds accepted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah uh, 17, Surah Isra, Ayah 19, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَئِكَ فَأُولَئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا Allah says, whoever desires the hereafter and works to achieve it while he or she has iman, it is those people whose working will be rewarded. So you're striving, you're struggling, will only be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you have iman. Not in the absence of iman. So in order for my charity, my fasting, my salawat, whatever I do to be accepted by Allah, it has to be coupled first, or rather the prerequisite has to be having iman in Allah. The fourth fruit, by the way, Iman has infinite fruits. We're just going through a little bit or some of those fruits of Iman. The fourth fruit, a means of forgiving sins. A means of forgiving sins. 
When you have Iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins. And a beautiful passage that's found in the towards the end of the 25th surah of the Quran, Surah Furqan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in ayah number 17. Powerful ayah, subhanAllah. Allah says, he talks about those who have wronged themselves, who have committed sins. And then Allah says, Except the one who makes tawbah towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeks Allah's forgiveness. The one who makes tawbah repents to Allah, says, you know, oh Allah, I am embarrassed. I am sorry for what I did. I feel guilty for what I did. This is called repentance. You have sincerity in your heart. Wa The second condition is that they have iman. So they repented. What caused them repentance, if you think about it, was iman. So this is rather the first thing is Iman. A person won't feel remorse, won't feel sadness if they never had Iman in the first place. So this person had Iman, this person then repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this person then followed up Iman with Amila, Amalam Saliha. Followed it up with good and righteous deeds. Remember what I told you? For the Sahaba, this we discussed this last week or two weeks ago. That for them, Iman didn't just mean, oh, Iman, belief, faith, that's it, go home. No, it was always together with actions. And this is what this ayah proves. Allah says, except for the one who repents to Allah, has Iman, follows it up with good deeds, فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِ حَسْنَةً Allah says, then those are the people whose evil deeds Allah will convert into good deeds. So a person had evil deeds as high as the mountains. Mountains upon mountains of evil deeds. And this person repented to Allah with a sincere heart, had iman. Allah doesn't just say he's going to erase those bad deeds. He doesn't just say that he will forgive those bad deeds. Allah goes even a step further. And Allah says that He will convert it. This is the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That He will convert them into mountains upon mountains of good deeds. This is the Rabbi you and I worship people. This is the Rabbi you and I worship. So we should never feel despair in our hearts. That you know, I don't have a job. Things are going difficult. I don't know, I lost so much money, I lost my family, I did this, I subhanAllah. Allah is so generous, Allah will take care of us. We must show that commitment and that devotion to Allah. Allah says that indeed He is the one who forgives and has mercy. Rahimah. The fifth fruit of Iman is achieving the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah Yunus, ayah 62. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ala inna awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. Allah says of a surety, it is the friends of Allah who upon them there is no fear, nor shall they grieve. May Allah make you and I from his awliya. May Allah make us from his awliya. You become from his friends, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they will never grieve. They won't have any sorrow. And what is the greatest grief? What is the greatest sorrow, people? On your work. We all know the hadith of the Rasul in which he said that there will be a person who suffered the most in this dunya. Suffered so much. And this is, by the way, a response to those who say, if God so loves the earth and loves people and justice, why is it that innocent people suffer? Why is it that innocent people go through this, that, and the other? And there's a more uh, uh, detailed academic response, but one of the elements of that response is this, that our Prophet, peace be upon him, has told us that those who have suffered the greatest atrocities in this dunya, who have suffered unimaginable pain and grief in this world, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, when Allah will 
dip them into Jannah once. Not that Allah will cause them to enter Jannah and they'll stay there for billions and billions of years. No, no, no. What did Allah do? Dipped them in Jannah once. And then Allah will say, did you suffer? What do you think their response would be? No. We never suffered, Ya Allah. Suffer? Did we suffer? All of their suffering they'll forget. You know, subhanAllah, it's a great thing when you read the news, when you see people suffering around the world, that your heart pains for them. And you're wondering, right? And then you come across this hadith. And then you feel, subhanAllah, you know, Allah is the most kind, most generous. Just like one of our teachers, he's an alim, he said, that you know, that your heart beats when you read about people around the world, uh, and you're making lots of dua for them. But something that makes you going is that for them, their test is done. You know, they've been killed, whatever. They're done, and Allah will take care of them. Hopefully, we pray to Allah that they are from the shuhada. Those who we should cry over is ourselves. We still have our lives to live. How much of this life will be spent in the worship of Allah, in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's something that we must always concern ourselves with. The sixth fruit is Allah will fight on your behalf. Allah will fight on my behalf. Allah tells us in Surah Hajj, Surah Hajj, Ayah 38. Surah Hajj is uh, Surah 22, Ayah 38. إن الله يدافع عن الذين آمنوا إن الله لا يحب كل خوان كفور. Allah says, Allah will fight and defend on behalf of those who have iman. So when you're facing difficulties, when you're seeing that there are certain things that are going on, where you feel defenseless, man, there's nobody to defend me. Allah will come to your defense. Allah will come to your defense. This is a promise from Allah as long as you have true faith in your heart. And if Allah is fighting for your cause, is there anyone who can cause you any harm thereafter? No, not at all. So even when there is difficulty, it's okay. It's okay, Allah will keep you going. SubhanAllah, you know one of the, one of the motivations I have of teaching this class is it subhanAllah puts so many things in perspective for me personally also. For me personally. Because sometimes at a workplace, you just have people who are just, you know, doing things that are unjust, blatantly unjust, that you are not guilty of. But you're just quiet because you're the employee. Of course you do all you can to raise your concerns, that's fine. But then who comes to your defense, subhanAllah, this is what gives you hope. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. Allah is watching him take care of you. Iman is a protection and comfort for the believers. Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 173. <laughs> Next time I'll just mention the first part and you guys will complete it, okay? And next week they disappear. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Imran, Ayah 173, when the people tried to scare them by saying that there was an army around them, this is during the battle of Uhud, that these munafiqun, they came to the believers and said that, you know what? There are armies around you. What did the Muslims say? Those who had iman, what did they say? They said, Allah is sufficient for us. Qalu hasbunallah. Allah is sufficient for us and He is our protector. So when the people of, of Iman are threatened by worldly loss, then they remind themselves that hasbunallah. Hasbunallah. And of course, the dua that all of you have memorized, hasbunallah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my mawla, Allah will take care of me. Iman is an exit and escape from all sorrows and problems. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Talaq, Ayah 2. It's a long ayah, I'll quickly summarize for this time, is of the essence. 
Whomever has the taqwa of Allah, Allah will make a way out for him. Allah will provide for him from a place he did not act, he did not expect. It's a powerful, subhanAllah, powerful ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that whoever has iman, whoever has taqwa in Allah, يَجْعَلَّهُ مَخْرَجًا Allah will open for him an exit door. Then all of his difficulties will be gone. Then this person will be raised up in this dunya and the akhirah. Allah tells us in Surah 58, Surah Mujadila, check is it 58? I believe it is 58. Ayah 11, those who have iman and have knowledge, Allah will raise their ranks. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, idha qila lakum tafassahu fil majalis fafsahu bayin. فافسحوا يفسح الله لكم وإذا قيل انشزوا فانشزوا يرفع الله الذين آمنوا منكم والذين أوتوا العلم درجات. Allah says that those who have iman that Allah will raise their ranks in this dunya and in the hereafter. And with this, inshallah, تعالى will come to an end. We still have a couple more fruits of iman to discuss. And discussing these, subhanAllah, should make you feel motivated again. That I want to make my Imam strong. The stronger my Imam with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, the closer I am to all of these fruits. The greater is my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with this, inshallah ta'ala, we'll open the session for questions. And inshallah. I hope to see all of you next week. Make sure you bring your friends as well as your family members. And whatever thoughts you have, certain comments, please feel free to share them now is the time. So on the head, it will be that it must be in. It's very difficult to find at work. You can just speak to say to other people the way they work, you can't see it. But when you say something that hurts them, sometimes it's out of control of ours. But to keep on doing the same stupid mistake, how can we control it? To be pious, the only way we can be pious is out of everything. Stay home or something. <laughs> stay in the room. That's why go somewhere in general. Stay there. That's the only way. It's so hard to avoid the other person in front of you saying something I don't know how you have handled it. May Allah bless uh, Brother Iftikhar Allah. He mentioned a very nice question. He's, he's, um, he's asking, the question I'll summarize it for you, that we've been talking about Iman and how the fruits of Iman are. And in our current circumstances, we notice, we find out that, and we experience this, that it becomes a challenge to live up to these standards. And these standards, sometimes a person feels a sense of, you know, pessimism that in order to live up to these standards, you just isolate yourself. Go to the cave, go to the jungle, go somewhere. How do you meet this challenge? By the workplace example, that you say certain things, maybe there are people working under you, and you know this person is, keeps on making the same mistakes, and you just get agitated, irritated, or maybe let me flip this around to your superiors. It's time for salah. It's, it's certain things that you have to do which your iman tells you that you cannot do. How do you navigate these? How do you navigate these difficulties? And subhanAllah, Brother Iftikhar, the, the answer is, you know, uh, it's, it's not a one black and white answer. It is, subhanAllah, a challenge. There's no doubt about this. And something that we can find somewhat uh, hope in is the ayah of Quran where Allah says that fear Allah as much as you can but be sincere in that because you and I may say oh fear Allah as much as I can alhamdulillah I'm doing the most I can but someone else will say oh fear Allah as much as I can you know what I cannot pray five times a day in public especially people will look at me I, you know, I, I, I can really can't. So Allah says, fear Allah as much as you can. So you know, I leave this. So where is that ground? So inshallah ta'ala for all of us in this room, that is not our situation. I hope inshallah that is not our situation because we said that's the bare minimum level of iman, the five pillars. That the five pillars of the, we don't 
play around with those. But then beyond this, what happens it is I would say that I am with you in the same boat. The struggle is real. That how do you navigate this difficulty? You try your best. You try your best. Those in you know positions of power, you try your best. I remember in one such halaqa, the alim, the sheikh, was asked a question by a business owner. And he said that I know this person, rather not a business owner, a manager, subhanAllah. Manager in a well-known company here uh, in, in our city. And he said that the hadith mentions that you should be forgiving to those under you, to your subordinates. Where do you draw the line of being lenient with your subordinates when you know they're making the same mistake every single day, that the project is gonna go down the drain, that you know the, there'll be huge losses, where do you draw the line of being lenient? And then the Sheikh had a very good answer. He said, you make it clear right from the onset that this is what the expectation is. And if you can meet this expectation 100%, great. If you cannot meet it, then mention it from now. This is how much I expect you to complete. If you don't do it, then here will be the consequences. And he said, once you've made this clear, the consequences will be you'll lose your job then you are not blameworthy because this person did not meet up to that level, bare minimum if you like. So this is what the sheikh told this manager, that this person clearly is now going to become a liability to the company, clearly is gonna you know, wreak havoc in the, in, in the business or whatever. You made it clear to them, now it's their own laziness, which you clearly know laziness, their own you know, uh, uh, mistakes, then you let them go. So navigating Iman in the workplace is definitely a, a, a huge challenge that every single one of us is facing. I don't have a clear-cut answer to this. We're all trying our best and we hope, inshallah, I tell my young brothers all the time, the two who have left, they know me. By the way, they uh, memorized the Quran at al a couple years back. Uh, so I tell them this, that you guys are in high school. It's your duty to tell the teacher when Salah time comes in. And your duty, if you want even to take it to the level of the principal's office, through your parents, whatever, take the right means, and you do your best. Now, beyond that, your teacher does not let you go and pray, then you have done your job. You will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I did the best I could. Because now you know this teacher will go out of their way to cause harm to you, which inshallah, I hope in our city that's not an issue. They allow them to go to pray, but that's the point. You do everything you can, inshallah, to make sure that your iman is not harmed in whatever way, shape, or form. Don't allow your iman to be harmed, people. Our iman is the only thing that is the most valuable to us. That is the only thing that the Rasul sallallahu told us a hadith about, that the people of the past would be tortured, would be killed because of this iman, but they never let go. So we should not let go of our iman as if it's something cheap. You know what, just throw it out the window, no, I'm not that. No, stand your firm ground and inshallah ta'ala, whatever mistakes you make, and subhanAllah, you and I, we feel our iman going down. If you feel your iman has gone down, and you do feel, I feel it, all of us feel it. Look at the month of Ramadan. When the month of Ramadan comes, you automatically feel your iman soar to the skies. You feel it strong, don't you? So your Iman is something that you feel when you've committed a sin, you feel that my Iman has been affected. So do the best that you can to then mend that through Tawbah, through extra good deeds. So the that we're talking about, we have to take it out daily, which is better, even if it's a dollar or two dollars. Only a proper source, at least we can take it out, put it somewhere in the... Not in the home, just talking about it. It's, the home never goes up. So we should take it out, put it in the masjid. It should be a box. And everyone who comes, they come here, whether they pray, they don't pray, come and put a sadaqah. At least that sadaqah has to be immediately given to the property.